Hi, welcome back to General Chemistry 2. My name is Chuck White, and today's lesson is a continuation of our discussion of nuclear chemistry. We're going to talk about radioactive decay kinetics, nuclear binding energies, nuclear energy from fission and fusion, and we'll talk about some applications of nuclear chemistry, including carbon dating and medical Im imaging. Now, all radioactive decay events decay by first-order kinetics. That's just a consequence of the fact that nuclei uh, decay spontaneously in an isolated uh, sense and don't need to interact or collide with other things around them. And so the decay rate decays exponentially, and we've seen before that tritium will decay spontaneously to uh, helium-3 and a beta particle, and this occurs with a half-life of 12.33 years. So after 37 years, or three half-lives, tritium loses about 95% of its potency as a beta emitter. Now there are two main ways of measuring radioactivity. If we're interested primarily in the decay rate, then usually we measure radioactivity in curies, or 3.7 times 10 to the 10th decays per second. A decay per second, or a becquerel, is the SI unit of um, radioactivity. Uh, the Curie, which is a non-SI unit, is uh, equivalent to the uh, uh, radioactivity of one gram of pure radium-226. Now the other way of measuring radi radioactivity is the REM, and this is more appropriate for measuring the absorbed uh, radiation energy in biological tissue. One REM corresponds to 0 0.01 joules of absorbed radiative energy per kilogram of tissue. Uh, and that's for um, beta and gamma radiation. If we're talking about alpha radiation, then uh, it turns out that alpha, alpha particles do much more damage, and 0.01 joules per kilogram would correspond to 20 rems, uh, because it does about 20 times more damage. Now the maximum recommended dose uh, of radiation is about 1 rem per year, and to put that into context, um, a dental x-ray will give you about 6 millirems of uh, dose, and a single dose of 1,000 rems is usually enough to kill uh, a human. Now let's talk about nuclear binding energy, and we'll use carbon-12 as an example. We have six protons, six neutrons, and six electrons in carbon-12, and if we measured the mass of all of those separated particles, it would turn out to be about 12.1 atomic mass units. The mass of an intact carbon-12 atoms is exactly 12 uh, atomic mass units by definition, and so the mass defect, or the amount by which the mass is lowered by bringing all of these particles together and uh, allowing allowing them to bind is nearly 0.1 AMU. Now Einstein tells us that the energy equivalent of mass is calculated by E equals mc squared, and so the amount of energy released when the nucleus gets bound together in carbon-12 is 8.9 times 10 to the 9th kilojoules per mole, and this is about 20 million times larger than um, chemical bond energies, so it's absolutely enormous. Let's take a look at the average binding energy per nucleon in millions of electron volts in this chart as a function of the uh, atomic number of the nucleus. On the left hand side we have hydrogen, uh, which normal hydrogen has no binding energy in its, its nucleus because it's just a proton, um, but it rises very very rapidly to helium-4 and then reaches a maximum at uh, iron-56 and then does a slow decline in the average binding energy per nucleon uh, until you get out to um, he really heavy at atoms like um, uranium-235 and 238. So iron is the most stable nucleus and everything to the left or to the right of it is less stable. So you can um, uh, release energy by splitting heavy nuclei into two lighter nuclei, or by fusing two very light nuclei like hydrogen or deuterium or tritium into uh, somewhat heavier nuclei like helium-4 or lithium. So let's take a look at the uh, fission of U-235. It turns out that uranium-235 can absorb a thermal neutron and undergo spontaneous fission to a barium atom, a krypton atom, and three neutrons, and at the same time releases nearly 20 terajoules per mole of energy. A terajoule is 10 to the 9th kilojoules, so this is an enormous amount of energy.
Now, because you get three neutrons in the products where you only used one neutron as the reactants, uh, this fission can be used to carry out a nuclear chain reaction, where you have one event which uh, releases three additional neutrons, each of which can um, cause additional fission uh, events. And so this uh, fission reaction can grow geometrically uh, very quickly. If you do it under controlled conditions, where you allow most of the neutrons to escape, uh, where they can't uh, uh, to stimulate other fission reactions, then you can have a stable nuclear reactor for generating power. If you don't do it under uncontrolled conditions where this geometric progression occurs, then you have an atom bomb. And this is the type of bomb that was dropped, dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki to end World War II. At the other end of the spectrum, we have nuclear fusion. And that's, uh, in this example, is where we take a deuterium atom and a tritium atom and fuse them together into a single helium-4 atom and uh, release a neutron and 7.2 terajoules per mole of energy. Uh, scientists at the National Ignition Facility at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory and other places in the world are trying to use clever ways of uh, inertially confining deuterium and tritium gas in very uh, small spaces at very, very high temperatures to get this fusion reaction to occur under controlled conditions where we could use it actually to generate um, electric power. One of the common applications of nuclear chemistry is carbon dating. And that's where we can tell the age of a sample if it originated from a living thing. The way this works is the cosmic ray particles in the Earth's atmosphere maintain a relatively constant constant concentration of carbon-14 relative to carbon-12 in living things. Uh, the, the rays turn nitrogen into carbon-14, which gets incorporated into CO2, which gets incorporated into plants, uh, which are eaten by animals and so forth. And, and so all living things have a relatively constant, relative concentration of carbon-14. After a plant or animal dies, then it no longer takes in this uh, carbon. And uh, so the carbon-14 then begins to decay with a half-life of 5,730 years. And so by measuring the carbon-14 rate of decay in an old sample, we can pinpoint its uh, age um, if it's less than about uh, 10,000 years old. And um, we can actually do a little bit better um, by uh, calibrating the method uh, using tree rings and sediment core, ocean sediment cores and things like that, so that we can really get a very precise measure of the date of an object. Now, one of the more celebrated cases of carbon dating was carried out in, by three independent laboratories in 1988 on the Shroud of Turin. Uh, and the results indicated that this shroud was made from linen around uh, 1325 AD. Now, these results have been criticized quite heavily by people who believe that the Shroud of Turin is the original burial garment of Jesus Christ. But from a scientific point of view, it seems unlikely that the carbon dating could be wrong by more than about a thousand years. Now, there are three main types of medical applications of nuclear chemistry. The first involves radio tracers, and this is where a radioactive isotope like technetium may be attached to a metabolically active compound containing phosphorus, for example, and uh, ingested in the body. And the phosphorus would tend to pull the radioactive uh, tracer to aggregate in cer certain areas of the body, like infections or tumors, or maybe in bone cancer inside the bones. and. Uh, um, then we use uh, detection of the radioactive um, uh, tracer to detect where the cancer tumors are in the body. So that's used mainly for uh, diagnosis and location of the tumors. Uh, in radiation therapy, what we do is we take x-rays uh, from a conventional source and uh, direct them more or less, uh, aim them directly at cancer tumors to kill the tumors. And the thing that's done uh, quite recently is to use machines which are uh, good at aiming the x-rays from many different angles. So the tumor itself gets a relatively high dose of x-rays, but the surrounding it, uh, tissue gets a, a lower dose of x-rays. And so that's uh, a lot easier on the patient and a lot harder on the tumor. Uh, finally, radiotherapy is where radioactive seeds or metal particles containing uh, iodine-125 or sometimes palladium-103 are inserted surgically directly into a 
tumor, and uh, the radiation is then um, used to kill the tumor. And this is a pretty common type of therapy used for prostate cancer, for example. That ends our series of lectures for General Chemistry 2. Uh, it's been nice, and uh, we hope to see you again sometime.